this man, Father, the way that our God works. And I pray that you would allow us in our lives to have times, many times, when the Spirit of God moves in us and does mighty things. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we know what the cycle is in Judges. God blesses. God's people are unfaithful. God promised. We saw the theme in the beginning of the book of Judges. God said to his people, he said, I said, remember this, I said, I said that if you will, then I will bless you. But if you will not, then I will, and he's talking about driving out the sin, driving out the inhabitants of the land, I will take the thing that you will not yield to me, and I'll use it to destroy you. And so if you won't get idolatry out of the land, then the idols will be the cause of your destruction. If you won't drive out the inhabitants who are wicked in the land, then I'll use those inhabitants to destroy you. One of the things we learned early on is that this sin that we won't deal with in our lives is the one that gets us. It's the one that destroys us. You know, so many times, isn't it so that we're afraid of the thing that will never be? It's amazing sometimes we're afraid, we're terrified of sin that really can't get us. More often we're terrified of maybe the wicked and their sin. We're horrified by it, we're amazed by it, and we're, uh, we're, we're even in fear of that same thing. And yet it really is probably never going to be for us. Now, I know for some um, this would not be so, but for, for I think probably everyone in this room, homosexuality is not the sin that's going to destroy you, I don't think. Uh, for most in this room, adultery is probably not what's going to get you. I hope in this room that murder is not the sin that's going to destroy you. But one of the things we find with God's people, the nation of Israel, is God's promise that the sin that you will not address in your life is a sin that will get you. Hey, your most important sin, I'm not talking about the one that's your best sin. I'm talking about the one you need to be most concerned about. It's the one that you have, not the one you don't have. And isn't it so that many times we focus either on the sins of others, a sin that's not ours, and we're so distracted, we're so overwhelmed, and we're so focused on that that we don't think that the sin that we have is a big deal, and it is. It's a cancer, and it will destroy you. We need to be constantly aware of this truth. And God promises people, the nation of Israel, if you won't drive out the inhabitants of the land, I'll use them to bring you into bondage. If you won't get rid of their idols, then their, their idols are going to use as a judgment against you. And then we saw the sin cycle. What's the sin cycle? And I was thinking about this a little bit today, and I, I, I find that there's something encouraging in it. I remember a couple weeks ago when God's people cried out, and God said, Go tell your idols. Remember this? Go tell your idols and, and ask them to deliver you. You know, you, you, you've worshipped them and let them take care of you. You've given them your, yourselves and let them have you, if you will. And yet God, when they put away their idols, delivers them. Do you get tired of seeing the same thing over and over? After a while, it's like, Pastor, I wonder what's going to happen tonight. <clears throat> right? What's going to happen in Israel this time? What's the sin cycle? Well, God blesses his people. He loves his people, the nation of Israel. Then instead of attributing his blessing to him and being grateful to him and being faithful to him, they begin to take for granted his blessing. They begin to worship idols. And when you worship an idol, essentially you're crediting the idol for the good things that God has done in your life. So you give the idol God's glory. And then after that, you come under God's judgment and you come into bondage. So there's sin, there's bondage, then you cry out to God and there's deliverance. Give the people of Israel a little bit of a break here because it's not all the same generation. I think we need to remember this sometimes, right? In other words, aren't you glad, aren't you glad uh, that you don't get judged for the sins of your fathers? Now, you learn sin from your fathers probably, but you're not accountable for your fathers. And God doesn't hold it against you. Sometimes I think, God, why do you pardon Israel over and over again? And it seems as though God says to me, well, they're different people every time. They're a different crowd every time. There's a couple reminders in that, some things that we need to take away before we ever go to Samson this evening, some things we need to remember. Your generation is the one in which you're required to be faithful to God. 
I, I tire many times of folks looking to, to the past. You know what good the past is in your generation? It's good for an example. That's all it's good for. It's good for an example of good or an example of evil. That's all the past is good for. If it was evil, don't repeat it. If it was good, then look at the things that are in it that are repeatable and take that direction. No one's ever dishonored or disobeyed God and had it work well. And so you can look at that from the Bible and you can look at it from history. And you can say, let's don't repeat. But Christian, we need to live in our day. We need to live in our generation. Don't be letting life pass you by as you look back or you look forward. So many individuals are looking back or they're looking forward in life. And this is one of the things that I want us to focus on this evening as we look at Samson's life. See, the fact is, is that I say many times that I'm far more impressed with someone who finishes well than someone who begins. But the truth of the matter is that you never finish well if you never began. There's, there are no finishers who are not beginners. And those who finish are not only those who have begun, but they're those who have continued. And continuing happens when in our lives? Past, present, future. Which one? In the present. Folks, we live in the present. We always will. We'll always live in the present. Today is the day that matters. Today is the day that matters, and it matters in your life. And if today you did not honor the Lord Jesus Christ, if today you did not serve God, if today you were not what God wanted you to be, then today, my friend, becomes yesterday, and yesterday is a past that's a failure. If today, instead of that, though, you honor God and you serve God and you live for God, and if that's so in your life, then tomorrow, today is the past in which you honored God. But you know your past means nothing? And we're going to see that in Samson's life this evening. But I want to point out a couple things that perhaps are not what we generally take away, but if you look carefully and closely, you'll find uh, some great truth. I want to focus on uh, 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 not every instance, but on several instances in which the Bible says the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Now let's define that first of all because we need to do so. When the Spirit of God came on Samson, did he behave normally or ab abnormally? Come on. What? Abnormally, abnormally right? Uh, and that's, that's always true. Uh, we could just say supernaturally. When God's Spirit came on Samson, Samson began to do things that only God could do. That's all we ought to desire in our lives. Christian, you ought to desire to do things God can do. Not in your strength, but in God's strength. That ought to be our desire. That ought to be our prayer. God, help me to do what you can do. You won't do it in your strength. You'll do it when God's Spirit comes upon you. And we can pray for that in our day and age today. I challenge you to study the Acts of the Apostles and look at the times when God's Spirit came upon the preachers of the gospel and to see how effective the gospel message began, or began, or I'm having a hard time saying it, became when God's Spirit came, fell on them, came on them. Okay? So now in verse 25 of chapter 13, the Spirit of the Lord began to move him. The Bible says, at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtay. Oh, I don't want to make a lot out of the uh, statement at times. It just simply means from time to time, God did great things in Samson's life. And to me, that's kind of a theme for Samson as you study his life. You begin to say, if you will tonight, if you want to just title the message tonight, you could just call it the times. The times in Samson's life. You know, times aren't all the same, are they? I like something Brother Will said last uh, Sunday morning, two Sunday mornings ago when he was here. And I thought, well, that's profound. And it's very, very true. He said that at the time in his life when his grandmother said, don't you know who's going to reach the deaf? And she said, no, I don't. I wish you'd tell her. He said, no, I don't. I wish you'd tell me. And she said, you are, and I'm going to help you. Well, that's not a very significant time. In other words, saying those words has no weight at all. If you think about it, anyone could say those words and go home and the next day do nothing. But the fact of the matter is, looking back at it, it I'm sure it wasn't like, you know, all of a sudden, you know, lights fell, you know, uh, lights came down from heaven and there was this dramatic pause in the car and, and uh, all of a sudden they had visions of grandeur of the great things God was going to do in the future. It was just a conversation in which something was said it was received, and that's all that happened. And then God did great things. And now you look back to it, and that's a momentous event that's remembered. Everybody knows, that knows the Bill Rice Ranch, knows that Kathy Rice said, 
Don't you know who's going to reach the deaf? And then Dr. Bill said, I wish you'd tell me. And she said, you are, and I'm going to help you. And do you know that if you're faithful to the Lord, your insignificant conversation can have that much significance? It's not a big moment, not a big happening, but yet in Samson's life, we're going to find that there are times. There are times. And you know that can be true of your life and mine, that from time to time, from occasion to occasion, that as God has prepared our hearts, and as we have, have yielded ourselves to Him and made preparation, that there are going to be times. You know, I think of last week as a great illustration. Uh, I, I got a letter today, and, and I want to pass it on to you. Brother Jonathan just told me, he said, I was just, he said, it just touched me how much uh, the people in your church worked on Saturday and throughout the week, just how available they were and all the hard work. And, just, and he said, I just, I didn't have anything to do but what I came to do, and everything else was just handled. And he said, your people just did an amazing job. Well, I think about that. I think of all the insignificant work that we did last week. Not very glorious, all the paper cuts, you know, as you're folding flyers. And as I'm folding flyers, I'm a percentages guy, I'm a math guy. And I'm always thinking, I wonder what the percentages are on the return of these flyers. You know, with door hangers, within six months, every 1,000 you get one visitor. So I'm thinking, well, I wonder what the return is on a three-on-three -three tournament in high school. And I'll tell you the numbers later if you care to know. Anyway, uh, <laughs> you know, but insignificant moments. So for every flyer that a child comes, if you will... And it comes and hears the gospel and gets saved. For every flyer, there are literally hundreds that are thrown on the ground, are left in a book bag, are tossed in the trash, and they're just moments. And yet on Saturday, we got to see a room packed with people to hear the gospel. We got to see an invitation. We couldn't handle it because so many people came forward. That was a moment. But it happened when there were times happened as a result of times, and, and many of them were not so glamorous. Well, that's, that's the first event that we look at in Samson's life. The fact of the matter is, is that uh, the Lord blessed him, verse 24 said, and the idea here is that he had God's hand in his life, and God's blessing in his life, and so from time to time, in a way that is not considered enough to be significant enough to go down forever in the Word of God, God's Spirit moved on him in the camp between Dan and in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtael. So God did some great things in Samson's life from time to time. Great. That's the first one we'll look at. Let's look at another one. Um, chapter 14, let's read down to verse 4. And Samson went down to Timnath and met a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Well, shame on you, Samson. And he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines, now, therefore, get her for me to wife. How many of you have heard a message about this? Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. So uh, here's Samson, the rebellious teenager, and he says, Mom and Dad, I want a Philistine girl. And his, and his uh, you know, spineless father you know, won't stand up to him and goes down and gets him a wife of the Philistines, and it causes him heartbreak, heartache, and trouble the rest of his life. That's not what the Bible says here. That's a bad message. Okay, let's read on. Verse 3. Then uh, it's, it's an unbiblical message, I should say. Okay. <laughs> That's a teen message. I, as a teenager, how many times as a teenager you heard that message preached? It's unscriptural. It's unbiblical. Look at the text. Verse 3. Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among all my people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? Hey, the Jewish girls aren't all ugly. Hey. Couldn't there just be one of them that's tolerable? Notice Samson's answer. Because that's what we think. Oh, you know, he wanted a wicked girl. He wanted a bad girl. Now verse 3, he says, And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. Verse 4, But his father and mother knew not that it was of the Lord. But his father and mother knew not that it was of the Lord. Well, pastor, you know, God works in mysterious ways. He's able to work all things together for good to them that love him. The Bible says it was of the Lord. I defy you to prove otherwise, my friend. That's what the Word of God says, and it's not a matter of semantics or interpretation. That's what it says. 
The first time that we see is significant in Samson's life. God moves him to do that, which is unusual. The, the first time God really moves in Samson's life, the first time that it's recorded more than just, yeah, God did things between you know, a couple of camps. The first time we see something significant in his life, we find that we're a little bit against him. Aren't we? Samson, come on. The Philistines, they're uncircumcised. Uncircumcision's also of the heart. It's not just outward, it's inward. Now, these individuals hate God's people. And do you know something? <laughs> he violated the principle of separation. Here. You know something else? So did his parents and every single other person in the nation of Israel. Remember what we looked at last time we were here? Remember what we looked at? His parents didn't even know. Didn't even know some basic things. His mother was told, no strong drink. His parents were told, he's to live this way. And it was a strange way of living for Manoah and the wife, which is her name, the wife. Samson's living with a lot of godless people. And I'll submit to you this evening that not only was there not separation in Samson's life, but there was no separation in Israel, period. There was such a lack of separation in Israel that there weren't even defined barriers or lines of demarcation. Think about this, if you will. Samson, the Bible says, in this instance, sought an occasion. God used it because he sought an occasion against the Philistines. There was not even an occasion. There wasn't even a grievance between God's people and the Philistines at this time in Samson's life. Those were the times. That was the time that God moved. Now let me qualify some things here. Okay, Pastor, so maybe I should just violate scriptural principles then and just take to wife without my parents' approval without ever considering uh, whether or not she's saved or whatever, and I'll just get the one that pleases me and not worry about anything else. Samson never really took her for a wife. She was taken from him instantly. Never had her for a wife, actually. That's what actually happened. Okay, so now look. Verse 4, his mother, father and mother knew not that it was of the Lord, that he sought an occasion against the Philistines. For at that time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. Okay, so now, Samson takes a wife, desires to have a wife, or, or tells his parents to get him a wife, of the Philistines. Who told Samson to do that? The Lord did. I don't want to get crazy with this, and, and you better watch out if you're going to. You know, don't say, well, pastor, I'm doing something and it looks wicked to everybody, but, you know, because I've got a word of knowledge, <laughs> then it's good. Friend, if it's wicked, it's wicked. God did something unusual here. God also told Hosea to go in and marry a prostitute. So when we look at things, when God does something like that, it's pretty significant what his reason and his purpose is. And God used Hosea's life to teach his people, the nation of Israel, about faithfulness and unfaithfulness. And in the end, it worked out well for Hosea because God said so. Let me just make a couple qualifications. Samson knew this was of the Lord. He didn't think it was of the Lord and figure out how to get the facts to support him. But I'll tell you something, no one else did. No one else did. There will be times in your life, you mark my words, when something is of the Lord and you will not have affirmation. There will be times in your life, there are times. Now, this is an exception. The Bible says a multitude of counselors are safety. But there will be times when God shows you something. And you know. And by the way, it's not obscure when the Holy Spirit of God talks to you. It's not a feeling or something funny. It's real. And Samson really did know what he was supposed to do. But the first time we see God doing something great in his life, he marries 
a daughter of the Philistine. And what happened? Well, uh, some of the some of the men um, had feasts. Verse ten. So his father went down to the woman, and Samson made there a feast, for so used the young men to do. So they used to party back then. Verse eleven. It came to pass. When they saw him, that they brought thirty companions to be with him. And Samson said unto them, I will now put forth a riddle unto you. Well, now this brings us back a little bit to a second time in Samson's life. Okay, Samson has acted of the Lord, the Bible says, and doing something that was not only unusual, it went against counsel, went against what he thought should be done. And now the Bible says in verse 5, Then Samson went down, this is the second time, and his father and his mother to Timnath, and came to the vineyards of Timnath. And behold, a young lion roared against him. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he rent him as he would have rent a kid, and he had nothing in his hand. But he told not his father or his mother what he had done. And he went down and talked with the woman, and she placed Samson well. Okay, so get this. There's a significant statement here, and it comes up again and again and again. The statement is he told not his father or his mother. Now, you think this is all random. Well, it just happened, and Samson's just happening to do things. Now, let me ask you a question. According to the Bible, not according to pastor, and you may not even like it, but just answer it truthfully, okay? According to the Bible, who told Samson to marry the daughter of the Philistines? God did, okay? Now, look at what he did the second time God did something mighty. The second time he did something mighty in his life, he didn't tell his parents about it. A lot of times we read over that statement, we read over that phrase, and we don't think very much about it. We just think, well, you know, I mean, Samson, is, it was so common for him to grab a lion and rip it apart with his bare hands that he didn't think to tell his parents. You know, it's not in the Bible for that reason. The Bible's not just saying it was such a casual, uh, no-concern moment for Samson to grab a lion and tear it apart with his bare hands that he didn't even bother mentioning because it's just, you know, it's just a common occurrence and this is the kind of guy he was. This is not a this is the kind of guy Samson was statement, right? The statement is not saying, here's the sort of thing Samson did. No, Samson is being used of the Lord and he's just got a riddle. He's just gotten a riddle. Out of the eater came forth something, well, out of the eater and out of the strong. Let's, let's say it real quick. Okay, so now, look with me down in verse 12. Samson said unto them, I will now put forth a riddle unto you. Now, why did Samson marry this woman? Well, he told his parents she pleased me. Why did he marry her? Because the Lord wanted him to. And the Bible says he sought occasion against the Philistines. That's the actual reason that Samson married her. And now he's seeking out his occasion. Okay, so now the Bible says, he put forth, I will put forth a riddle unto you. Verse 12, if ye can certainly declare it me within the seven days of the feast and find it out, then I will give you 30 sheets of and 30 changes of garments. So there's 30 men, young men there. They brought 30 companions. The Bible says to be with him. The Philistines did. So he's got Philistine companions. And he tells his Philistine companions, you say, Pastor, boy, this is a classic teen message. Now, not only has Samson got a Philistine wife, but now he has Philistine companions. And you know what he has the Philistine companions for? Because of the Lord, and he's seeking an occasion against the Philistines. And somehow he has to have contact with them in order to have the occasion. It's interesting how God works here. It's not just Samson go randomly murder a bunch of Philistines. It's interesting, is I mean, God could God have said, you know, Samson, now that you know you know what it's like to be moved to the Lord, now that you know what it's like to tear a lion in half, now just go down there and tear up the Philistines in the same way. No, God sought an occasion against the Philistines. And here, if you'll study it, is, an, is a, a very perfect illustration of the justice of God. God doesn't just randomly judge. He judges the wicked. And he judges for sin that's committed, not for sin that is just, you're just guilty of it. And you haven't done anything. So this, if you study it, you'll see here, you'll find here how just God is when he judges sin. And God sought an occasion. In other words, there had to be something legitimate that the Philistines did. Now, in verse 14, he says, here's the riddle, out of the eater came forth meat, and out of the strong came forth sweetness, and they could not in three days expound the riddle. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they said unto Samson's wife, entice thy husband, that he may declare unto us the riddle, lest we burn thee in thy father's house with fire. Have ye called us to take that which that we have? Is it not so? So now, 
they go to Samson's wife and they say to her, we're about to suffer great loss from this Hebrew. And we're going to burn you and your parents' house. Are these nice guys? Are they good losers? Now, keep in mind the ratio here. If Samson loses, he has to pay 30 garments. If they lose, they have to pay one apiece. So the loss, if these individuals, they agreed to try to figure out the riddle. Their loss is far less than the loss Samson is about to encounter, about to suffer. These are not just men. These are not clever men. These are wicked men. And they say to Samson's wife, if we lose, we're going to burn you out. Well, Samson's wife wept before him and said, Thou dost hate, thou dost but hate me, and lovest me not. Thou hast put forth the riddle unto the children of my people, and hast not told it me. And he said unto her, Behold, I have not told it my father nor my mother. And shall I tell it thee? Okay, in verse 16, we kind of find the reason that Samson didn't tell his parents. What is it? Help us now think about this. We're thinkers, right? Why didn't he tell his father and his mother? Because if you don't tell anyone, no one will find out. That's just common sense. The reason he didn't tell his father and mother is so dad didn't say, Hey, let me tell you what my boy did. Dads like to brag. And uh, moms, you know, like to be in the kitchen and uh, talk about the exploits of their children. And he didn't want his parents bragging on him because he was going to use it. You see, he had a purpose in keeping it quiet. The scripture makes that very apparent. And Samson said, I haven't told my parents. You think I'm going to tell you? But he did. He did. Okay? She wept before him the seven days while their feast lasted, and it came to pass on the seventh day that he told her, because she lay sore upon him, and she told the riddle to the children of her people. And the men of the city said unto him on the seventh day before the sun went down, What is sweeter than honey, and what is stronger than a lion? And he said unto them, If ye had not plowed with my heifer, ye had not found out my riddle. And that is a classic statement, and I like it. Anyway, verse 19. Okay, so the second occasion we find... If he had not plowed with my heifer, he had not found out my riddle. Verse 19, we find a third occasion in which the Spirit of God comes upon him. The second time the Spirit of God comes upon him, Samson is impressed to keep a secret. And yet there's a little bit of a betrayal here. He doesn't keep the secret quite as well as he was impressed to keep it. He didn't tell his parents. Good, Samson. Good thinking. Good job. But he told the Philistines. And who was the enemy? Now, here we can preach to teenagers. Here we can preach to teenagers, hey, when you get when you get in a relationship you shouldn't be in, then it's going to cause you to do things that you shouldn't do. Be careful. Be careful who you're in a relationship with. Be guarded. Hey, you know what? We could talk about relationships here tonight, couldn't we? You know, the Bible says we're not to go all together out of this world. That's what the Scripture teaches. Hey, we live here. We live on this earth. And we're supposed to be salt and light here, and so we're supposed to be reaching those that surround us. But we don't need to be telling them our secrets, if you will. And that's not to say that we have some kind of religious secrets this evening. But friend, we do have the means to God's power in our lives. You know why the enemy wants to know secrets? You know why the enemy wants to know where your strength comes from? Because they want the same strength? No, friend, because they want to figure out how to defeat you. Don't give up the source of your strength. And I'm not saying keep it a secret that God's the source of your strength. But what I'm saying here is don't give it up. Don't give it to a Philistine. Don't give it to anyone else. And Samson had been impressed by God. He'd been moved by God to keep a secret. And yet he betrayed what God had told him to do. And here we find that Samson has failed. Samson has not done what the Spirit of God's led him to do. Now, I wouldn't argue that he wasn't supposed to marry the Philistine woman. The Bible says he was. It was of the Lord. And God was going to use him to seek occasion against the Philistines. All right, verse 19, the Spirit of God came, the Lord came upon him. And he went down to Ashkelon and slew 30 men of them and took their spoil and gave change of garments unto them which expounded the riddle. The Bible says, and his anger was kindled. You know what that means? He got his dander up just a little baby, a little bit mad. <laughs> and he went up to his father's house. Now look at verse 20. Now let me ask you a question. Why did Samson marry the Philistine woman according to the scripture this evening? To seek occasion against the Philistine. To seek occasion against the Philistine. Who told him to? God. God did. He did so because God said to. And now we find another occasion. 
let me just interject here. When God tells you to do something that perhaps is unusual, God always confirms why he did it. <laughs> You're not going to go to your grave and everybody's going to say, I don't know why he did that. He says God made him do it and he, I still can't see why. No, you'll know why. God reveals his hand. He shows his hand. He's always working. He's always moving. You can't see the future until the present has passed. That's quite a statement. We've got to take that and run with it. All right. But you can't see the future. But the time does come when you can look back and say, I see what God did. I know what God did. Could, could we give testimony of that in our lives this evening? Has there ever been something that you knew God had placed or done in your life? You would examined yourself, perhaps something bad happened. Something that caused great duress, great distress in your, for you personally. And you examined yourself and you said, God, what are you trying to teach me? What are you trying to show me? And as you're honest with the Lord and as you're in God's word and as you're seeking and, and God's answer to you is, I'm just working. I'm just doing something in your life. I'm just teaching. I'm just moving. I'm just making something happen that will be to my glory. Friend, the day will come when you'll see how it's to God's glory. That's how God moves and works. He doesn't do things randomly and then you never know what happened. God does things on purpose. So, verse 20, or verse 1 of chapter 15, But it came to pass within a while after, in the time of the wheat harvest, so the timing's pretty good, that Samson visited his wife with a kid. And uh, <laughs> we're talking about a, a baby goat here, in case you don't know. And he said... I will go into my wife into the chamber, but the father would not suffer him to go in. And her father said, I verily or truly, I thought that thou had suddenly hated her. Now let me ask you a question. What made him think that? What made this girl's dad think that Samson hated her? She betrayed him. <laughs> She's a lying, wicked, traitorous wife. So, I mean, the, the logic's there. So he's not just saying, so he's just like, well, I, you know, I thought you'd want to kill her, so might as well just give her to someone else because I didn't think you'd want her anymore. I just think that's interesting. No comment. All right, now, he said in verse 2, he said, Is not her younger sister fairer than she? Take her, I pray thee, instead of her. It's like, well, you know, try the other one. You know, she's probably not a liar. And Samson said concerning them, Now shall I be more blameless than the Philistines, although though I do them a displeasure. So what is Samson's purpose in marrying this wife? Seeking He's seeking an occasion. And do you realize that at this point he is blameless? He's blameless. It's interesting. He hasn't done anything wrong. That's what the Bible says. And now Samson goes, and he does something pretty interesting. He catches a hundred foxes. Brother Chris and I were talking about this today. And uh, I, I know some folks that have been in Iraq and Afghanistan, and they say the foxes over there are like the cats at our new building. They're just all over the place and into everything. And so, uh, but we were talking about Samson was probably not only um, strong, he must have been pretty quick. Uh, you know, <laughs> so I don't, I, next time I see a fox, I did see one this last fall, but I think it was protected, so I probably shouldn't do it. I should try grabbing one by the tail and just see uh, how that works, is to find out, you know, do some scientific research to find out, you know, what it means to grab 100 foxes and tie their tails together. But notice the timing here that God uses in Samson's life. It's at the wheat harvest. Well, this is a significant time because this is when they're bringing in the harvest that is going to sustain them through the hard times of the year. And so now, as Samson's come and he's been deeply wrong, he's going to avenge himself and be blameless toward the Philistines. So he captures the foxes, ties their tails together, and puts a torch on them and cuts them loose. And I, I guess they run slowly enough that everything catches on fire. I don't know how foxes run with their tails tied together. We really need some foxes <laughs> and some experimenting, and I'll grill them afterward if, uh, if you can get them. So anyway, I don't know, as long as it's legal. All right, now... And Samson said, uh, or in verse 6, Then the Philistines said, Who hath done this? And they answered Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he hath taken his wife and given her to his companion. And the Philistines came up and burnt her and her father with fire. 
Why did God have Samson marry the Philistine woman? Because he sought an occasion against them. We're on the third occasion. They just burned his wife and her dad. And now he's got another occasion. And Samson said unto them, Though ye have done this, yet will I be avenged of you, and after that I will cease. So Samson said, Well, I've got an occasion here, and when I get done with my occasion, I'm not going to do anything unjust. You ever seen Samson as a just judge? You ever seen this part of Samson? I just think that it's interesting that we don't very often talk about what an honorable man he was. Most of the time we see Samson as a philanderer. We see him as an individual that's unfaithful. We see him as a, as a wicked man. But the truth is, is that up to this point in his life, you and I don't have much to say about him. According to the word of God, he's had three occasions and God moved in his life so that he would be innocent. At this point, he's an innocent man. And he smote them hip and thigh, the Bible says, with great slaughter. And he went down and dwelt in the top of the rock, Etam. We're going to end that. We're going to end there this evening. We don't have time to go any further, but we're seeing the beginning in Samson's life. And let me just ask you a question, simple question: If we were to say, up to this point, if we were to comment on Samson's life, would you say he's begun well? I think so. Do you think God's used him yet in his life? Not only occasionally as he's grown up, but he's been mightily used. And he's innocent. He's an innocent man. He's innocent of the blood of these Philistines because they have done things that were worthy of death. And God's used him mightily. Now we're going to see Samson. We're going to see two more phases. We're going to look at how he began. We're going to look at how he continued. This is Samson's beginning as the judge of Israel, the deliverer of Israel. What's happening at this point is that there's a champion in the nation of Israel. There's an individual that makes it so that though the Philistines would like to oppress Israel, there is beginning to be some reservation in them placing them under bondage. Because you see, there's a guy that's become known. He's become known to have God's mighty hand upon him. And you don't mess with somebody who God has his hand upon. And so Samson has begun well. Samson's begun well. Now let's make some application here tonight, shall we? We've looked at the story. We've looked at the facts. Let's look at some practical aspects of it. Christian, where are you at? Where are you at? You know, I don't care where you've been. You can always begin. Your past is always in the past. But there's always a new beginning. You may see yourself this evening as a beginner. I still feel young in many ways. Uh, I've been saved now for more than 30 years. I praise the Lord for God saving me at an early age, but I've been saved for more than 30 years now. And so in comparison to a lot of Christians, I'm at least a middle-ager in a lot of aspects. At least middle-aged. been saved quite a while. And um, sometimes I, you know, I still pray and ask God. You know, I, when I was 30 years old, I prayed to God, I'm asking you for 30 years of ministry. Would you give me 30 years? And that's my heart's desire. I don't know if that's what the Lord's going to grant in my life, but that's what I want. I'd like to have 30 years from 30 uh, to, to serve the Lord, to live for God. I'd love it if God would give me more than that. I love living. don't have a death wish at all. I'd love to see the Lord, but I'd like to stand before Him having served Him. But I feel like a beginner. I feel like I just started to serve the Lord, and, I, and I, I'm a bit of an optimist. I think that, the, the, that there's a great future before us. I think that there's a lot that's coming, that God's going to do some great things. I've seen occasions. I mean, God's just done some things so that I know he can do great things. But I feel like a beginner. You know, God's going to do something great. Do you know, it doesn't matter where you're at in life, you can always be a good beginner. You say, Pastor, you know, I've begun a lot of times. Well, then you might be a bit of a middler, but go ahead and start over if you're not. If you're not doing well, go ahead and begin again and ask God for his mercy. See, God is going to do something in Samson's life, and he started well. But the question is, at this point, how's he going to end? You know, don't you? You know how he ends. And you know what? I think he ends rather well. I think he ends rather well. 
But we're going to see next week, we're going to look at the examples. We're going to see what typically happens. Samson's a pretty typical guy, actually. His, his life is pretty typical. Many young people, well, if they've, if they've gotten to know the Lord at an early age, a lot of times they kind of start out well. They kind of come to a place in life where they think it's more important to be successful the world's way. It's better to have honor the world's way, and they don't continue well. We're going to see that aspect of Samson, and I think that that really tells more about the man than anything else. Not how he began, not how he ended, but how he continued. You know that's the hard part in any job, in any place, in any task? It's not the beginning, it's not the ending. Hey, driving the last nail is pretty easy, isn't it? Driving, you know, digging the first shovel full of dirt is pretty exciting. But somewhere right down in the middle when you can't see the beginning, and you can't remember the beginning and you can't see the end, is where most of us end up. You don't know how many years you've got left. You don't know how many days. You don't know the days that God's going to come upon you and do mighty things. So a lot of us, kind of right there between beginning and middling. It's kind of out there in the middle. I want us to pray this week and ask God, God, where am I at in comparison to Samson? Because he was pretty typical, pretty average guy. Had some pretty great successes. But it's how you continue that matters. We're going to see next week how Samson continued. Unfortunately, it wasn't as well as it began. In the beginning, God sought an occasion against the Philistines, and Samson found three occasions and was blameless in each of them. If God does a work in your life, you'll be blameless as well. God will do great things, but he wants you to continue in him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us not to be prideful when we look at Samson. Help us not to be quick to pass judgment where your word does not condemn. At the same time, Father, Help us not to just begin to accept it that many individuals don't continue well, but Lord, help us to have the desire to be the exception. To do well in the part of life where Samson had his ups and downs, Lord, I ask you to show us that you're able always to continue in our lives as you've begun. And Lord, we ask it to be true of us that you who have begun a good work in us will complete or perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.